for uh, anyone who hasn't used Zoom before, just use this time, just have a quick look around. Um, down the bottom, you have a, a Q and A function. So in there, you can send questions to the panel um, and you can make them anonymous um, and send them just directly to us or you can send them openly. And the same with the chat box, feel free to drop a, a note in the chat box and say hi to everyone and uh, let everyone know you're here and you can comment sort of as we talk. Um, obviously the idea of today is very much to open the conversation um, between everyone that's here, um, members of the MBRA, repairers and CHCs and members of the CHO as well. Um, so please take that time to really interact with us. Um, that's the best way this is going to work. So whether that's through the chat function or on the questions as well. Um, we'll just give it a final few seconds just for the final few people to filter in um, and then we'll kick off. So as said, feel free just to say hi to everyone um, or say hi to the panel on there and just make yourself familiar with the full uh, functions of Zoom and what you can do. So with us today, I'll go around my screen as, as I have it anyway. Um, we've got Paul Cunningham from Fix Auto Dagenham. Hi, Paul. Hi. Hello, Matt. Hello, everyone. Uh, Chris Weeks from the MBRA. Hi, everybody. We've got Peter Gomes, who's head of business at the CHO. And just a, a last minute replacement, unfortunately, for Kirsty, who's had to uh, step out for work commitments. And we've got Sean Harper from S&G Response as well. Hi, Sean. Hi, Matt. Hi, everyone. How are you all? Perfect. So we'll kick into it. So first thing really is talking about the current situation that we're in at the moment in terms of the, obviously the COVID pandemic, the effect that's had on business and if there's anything in particular that repairers and CHCs can do between themselves um, to make the process a little bit easier. How can we help each other out? Um, there might be some very simple solutions that we haven't sort of discussed before that would help both sides out. So Paul, I'm going to come to you. If you just sort of give a generic overview of um, the current sort of problems you're having. Obviously, you've stayed open throughout the time. Um, and then just anything you think the CHCs can maybe do that will help any processes that you're struggling with? Sure. First and foremost, yeah, for those that don't know me, I'm Paul Cunningham. I'm the commercial director at Fix Auto Dagenham. We're a two-shop uh, body shop. We've got one in Raynham and one in Dagenham. Um, my current situation is... We've had to furlough one of the sites or close one of the sites and furlough the staff and furlough a percentage, a small percentage of the staff at the main site in Dagenham. This has allowed us to keep trading um, without making too much of a loss. Our objective at the beginning of all of this madness was to effectively um, look after the business to a point where we don't lose lots of money and we um, come out the other side in not too un unhealthy a position. Um, in terms of THOs and my sort of main in terms of what they can do, for us, uh, historically there's always been very long sort of payment terms. Um, and in this day and age, I think uh, those payment terms are almost unsustainable, especially in the position we're in now. The future as well, I, I know we've been open and we've been managing to trade. There's going to be lots of body shops that haven't been open for a long period of time. And my thoughts are they're going to come back and they're going to be struggling for cash flow and have to move back into a 60, 90 day terms period and possibly not be able to do it. So objective wise, I think there's a large one there that's to consider and to think about. Cash flow is going to be key. It's key for us now with, within this pandemic, and it will be key for you coming back. I think to, to go to the other side of the discussion, then, if I come to yourself, Sean, um, you obviously sit and look after the repairers but, and working at SNG. Um, first of all, struggles you've had through this time, I'm sure, same as, as many people, you know, you're working from home and have had to fellow a number of staff as well. But it's also what things can be done to, to help those repairers and to help yourself from the, the credit hire perspective as well. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, the, uh, firstly, before we kick off, the biggest challenge that I've had is learning how to make 50,000 snacks every day for the children that are running around the house. That is the biggest challenge. Um, outside of that, um, safeguarding the staff at S&G uh, response and making sure that we got them into a safe place and making sure that they were okay. Uh, we've got 120 staff operating out of Wilmslow, um, specialising in fleet, 
credit hire and insurance services. So we, first things first, the, the, the kudos goes to our IT staff to actually mobilise and make sure that everybody was working from home. That I'm surprised how slick it was. It was absolutely fantastic. So it literally took two days and everything was working as if, it, as if we were in the office. The second task was then to tend to the supply chain and the needs that they had to make sure that we were in constant communication with them. And we found that the supply chain was hovering between open slightly open or totally closed and to get a clear picture on that was our first challenge so some of the repairers didn't actually want to tell us that they were fully closed some of them said that they were part open but the, the reality is they were just actually answering the phone um, and not doing anything productive so once we opened up that line of communication and got the landing point of where every single repairer was that transparency then made it a heck of a lot easier for ourselves to actually manage the claims that we had work in progress. And also, even though volumes were down, the small amount of claims that we had to put out, so that was our first biggest challenge. But to be fair, the repairers that are on the network have been really open, really transparent, and work with us. Um, and I think like everybody else is seeing now, 99% of the repairers are open. We've got quite an extensive HGV network because we do a heck of a lot of fleet repairs and fleet work. And to be fair, there is still some HGV repairers that are just coming back. But we're seeing now that the repair network is open. The biggest challenge to us, to be fair, is the same challenge that I would say with the repairers. We're not an insurance company. Okay, so with insurance companies, when claims volumes go down, their profits, um, I'm not saying go up, but are not effective negatively. With ourselves, when we're not looking after accidents and placing accidents and the like through repairs and through our suppliers, we don't make money. So looking after our cash flow, looking after our repairers' cash flow and making sure that everything transparent has been probably the key driver for ourselves. Uh, the other main thing for ourselves is, and, and I'm sure it is for, for Paul and, and for Chris's scenario planning, because this hasn't happened before. We don't know when things are going to come back. We still don't 100% know. We're trying to scenario plan for every eventuality week on week on week on week. Um, so those have been our biggest challenges. One, one, one thing that I must say at this point is uh, one of the challenges that we identified quite early on was the need to talk to insurers and reach out to third party insurers and in, interact with them. And I've got to say that has proved not to be a challenge. The insurers have been receptive, communication has been really good and they've been open to fresh and new conversations. So in terms of talking to the insurers i'll just put paul's point to you on in terms of payment terms and obviously i know there's commercial sensitive information so obviously not asking for any of that of course um is that something as a chc you think you can look at does that involve having conversations with insurers and is that where the first conversation needs to take place how do you see that i don't we, we've not had the opportunity to do that so far we've we've reached out to the people that pay us and and contracted payment terms are contracted payment terms that's with the people that pay ourselves s and g and that's been quite smooth outside of contract terms it's not been quite as smooth we have certain work streams where it comes via dealerships those dealerships have been closed there's no way that you can get money in from those dealerships when they're short um we've also had certain work providers where their finance function might not sit in this country and it's been closed so we have been affected in the same way that everybody else has been affected. Affected, sorry. One thing that we did try and do um, at the beginning of April is draw up a charter to actually give to our repairers to say that is what you can expect over the next two months. Okay, and it will be paid on that day, and it will be for these specific jobs. So we're not really bringing payment terms forward, but we are giving a degree of security and an arm around the shoulder in an uncertain time, which, to be honest, I'm not sure if anybody else has done it. I'm not saying they haven't, but for ourselves, no, we thought it was a, a unique and good way of interacting with the supply chain. 
and, and allows them to manage the cash flow as well in terms of the forecast. Yeah. Absolutely. Chris, I'll come over to you and if you can speak generally about challenges that repairers have faced, but also payment terms, as that's obviously quite a key challenge that's come out. Cash flow is obviously king for everyone at the moment. So if you just touch on that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for having us on here. Um, and it's amazing, isn't it? it's taken like a crisis to get the industry talking to each other. And we've done more talking and understanding. Uh, over the last sort of 10 weeks. I think we ever have. It's, it's been brilliant, really. Um, but yeah, I, I'm the director of the uh, MBRA. Uh, we have about sort of 800 body shop members throughout the UK and we, we represent their interests. Um, I, I talk to Kirsty quite a lot, who heads up the CHO. And, and we kind of sort of thought it would be good for uh, CHCs and repairers to get a good understanding of each other's perspective through this and also use this as a bit of a springboard to see whether we can do any more in the future. Um, so from, from our perspective and the repairer's perspective, you know, I think it, you know, it all started out with a bit of a, a problem with parts initially. Or we thought it was going to be a problem with parts from, from the Far East. Um, and, and that was an issue right from the outset, getting hold of bits. Uh, very quickly, the the volumes of repairs sort of dropped down to probably 20%, you know, and some estimates even 10% of what we would normally see, um, which instantly created a lot of pressure for the part suppliers and repairers uh, in order to, you know, how can they keep going? So very quickly, repairers started to face the challenge of how do we cut costs and how can we furlough the staff using the job retention scheme. So the MBRA were very busy to begin with, uh, providing advice on the furlough scheme, um, you know, making it simple. Um, and, you know, we've continued to sort of uh, work on that process around the furlough scheme later on. And we've recently written to the Chancellor asking for flexibility, or greater flexibility at this point. Uh, I think there's a lot of repairers that would like to bring uh, and you know a number of people back on a part-time basis at the moment so we're still ongoing on that but you know straight away the repairers were thrown into a bit of a dilemma really you know you've got those brilliant working relationships that they've had with the work providers and they want to support them through it and want to keep doing the work for them. Uh, and they're also coming under a bit of pressure to do that in certain instances um, but then you also had the challenge of staff safety and you know can we really protect our employees which is really important um so a lot of repairs back in that dilemma um and we've we did a lot of work at the outset to try and help them um work through that and work through the elements of you know the the p l uh, we produced a, a break-even calculator for repairers to help them understand um, what costs they could get rid of and what they would need to charge uh, in order to sort of break even and make a small profit on the lower volumes of work that they had. So, so that, was, that was quite, you know, useful uh, to begin with. And then it started to move towards cash, you know, how, where, where are we going to sort of keep our money coming from? Uh, the government started to provide different sort of breaks for businesses, such as the, uh, the rates relief and the government grants. Um, and we did a lot of work, you know, we, and we continue to do a lot of work helping the repairers to get the rates relief um, and to get those government grants. And, you know, we provided stock uh, letters that can go to the council. So if any repairers out there <laughs> still haven't done that, you know, we can, we can give them a lot of help with that. Um, but that was a big important part for them. And some of the grants of 25 grand uh, were an absolute lifeline to, to some of the repairers. But very quickly, you know, those repairers that continued to keep working and supporting the work providers um, were struggling financially. You know, you, you can't run a business on 30% of its normal turnover. Uh, but car, car crash repairs are a high turnover, low margin kind of business. And all of the contracts that they work to typically are set up for high volume, low margin. And, and somebody had to make that argument uh, or make that case to work providers out there that these aren't normal times and body repairers can't survive on what, what they're being given. It just isn't enough. 
Um, so we wrote an open letter to uh, most of the underwriters, the insurers, urging them to change, really, uh, and see if they could provide more, more rates. Um, we went on countless webinars uh, talking about the issues. You know, and, and everything becomes a problem with low volume. You know, with a with a big courtesy car fleet that's been leased, yeah. you can't escape that cost. Um, with big estimating software charges that you can't escape, uh, that aren't volume related. Every single thing that repairers were doing were becoming very expensive on a per job basis. You know, and we had to make that point uh, to everybody listen repeatedly um, and, and that sort of culminated in um, a letter or, or a set of COVID-19 temporary charges that we recommended the, uh, the Body Shop World started to implement. Some have, some haven't, um, some, re some insurers have rejected them wholeheartedly, some of them haven't openly accepted those charges uh, but on a case-by-case -case basis are allowing a lot of them to, to go through. So that, that was really helpful. You know, but just, just to try and give you an indication of that, probably, you know, every repair would need an extra 400, 30% uh, of normal volume, every repair would have needed something like 400 pounds extra on it just to break even. So, so that was a big part of what we're doing. Um, you know, and then we sort of moved back to cash, helping, you know, making sure repairers are clearing all their aged debt. And we've been supporting them with that as well. Um, we got nine grand back for a member um, last week from one accident management company. You know, they've got the money. They want to pay it. It's just a matter of going through the process of facing it. So we've been really happy to do that. Um, and I'll just quickly pick up on aged debt. If I come over to you, Sean, quickly on that in terms of, I know you spent some time working on that as well with your network. Maybe just touch on that. We like, yeah, exactly like Chris has said, we've really pushed on that. So two areas that we've looked to help the uh, network straight away is age debt, but also the invoicing processing from when this actually kicked in. So our invoicing service levels um, in terms of when we actually start chasing, we've significantly accelerated. Uh, now, we've not done that at the detriment of the repairer just to tie them up and make things harder. But if they've had challenges, for example, getting signatures from clients, we've spoken to the client, we've helped speed that process up to get the invoices in quicker so we can bill out quicker and get the payment cycle sped up. We've also gone out to the repairers as well and said, your age debt that we might have been looking at or might have been sorting, refresh us, where's that up to? And then, like Chris said, we've unlocked the key. Do you know what I mean? To try and give back to them to say, look, while staff, while things are down a little bit, let's look at that, free it up and make, make it happen. And to be fair, the feedback has been really good on that. And it's one of those little things that you can unlock and do while volumes are down. I think, well, unlocking is a key term. And that's, that's what we're here for, I think, to find out, you know, the different things you can unlock and how you can help. Um, just on that, I'm sure, you know, it's been a difficult time for, for both industries when there's no traffic on the road. It obviously has a, a huge effect or, or low traffic on the road, should I say. Um, so any points you'd like to make, please, you know, carry on firing them through and, and we'll pick up on those. Um, if, any ideas on, on how either side can help? Um, I'm sure it's things that we can discuss and, and look to work on. Um, Peter, I'll come over to you. Obviously, as head of business at the CHO, you speak to a lot of credit hiring companies um, who, as I said, you know, have been going through tough times as well. Just touch on a little bit of sort of um, what they've been going through at the moment. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So I think in the first instance, there was concern that cash flow would dry up. And inevitably, uh, what tended to be noticed first was the, the major decline in volume. So in the roads went quiet. I cycled over the M6 at one point and thought it was something out of the 1960s. Was just simply nothing there um, and that has meant that uh, traffic volumes were down or accident rates were down and as we mentioned earlier uh, volumes were just plummeting um, so there were two impacts in the short term the first being the decline in business volumes the second being certainly a fear in the initial period that cash flow would be adversely affected and, and that was partially manifest i think by a quite 
one might say, aggressive belligerent attitude that we saw on the part of insurers and some defendant solicitors uh, to the extent that they were almost making the impact of COVID-19 more problematic than needed to be the case. Whereas you were seeing in the wider world, people were saying, this is a difficult time, I'm going to do my bit to make things easier. Our sense was that unfortunately on the part of insurers, the, the mood music initially at least was, we're going to take advantage of COVID-19 to either hit you with cash flows or hit you with volumes by making things more difficult for you to put cars out on the road. And having said that, in the first three or four weeks, the feedback from our members were things were, were clearly not great, but not quite as bad as they feared. Um, and there did seem to be some sense that insurers were, were willing to pay, were willing to start looking at some old stuff, and where people had uh, volumes of staff not doing what they would ordinarily do, they could put them onto age debt, chase insurers down, and insurers clearly sitting on piles of cash at this point in time, um, were to some extent doing better than was the case. Having said that, as an industry and as the representative body of our industry, we were quite perturbed by the stance initially shown by insurers to the extent that we reached out in the current jargon to the FCA and said, uh, are you aware that this is the stance being taken? Because I don't know if you're aware, uh, quite early on in the process, government was saying to insurers, stop uh, playing games here. You need to put your hand in the pocket. Now is the time that people need your uh, support. Uh, don't play games to try and get out of your responsibilities. Uh, and we uh, put together a pack of information that we sent to the FCA. They came back to us and said, we'd like to talk me to understand this further. And inevitably being uh, the nature of the body that they are, they're not going to spell out for you what they're going to do next with it. But there, there was certainly enthusiasm on their part to understand the issues that our members were facing. Um, because in particular, they felt that things like increased intervention on the part of insurers was clearly not playing ball in, in the way that uh, they felt business should be conducted. Um, of more recent times, uh, clearly traffic volumes are on the increase and therefore volumes are on the increase. But for uh, credit hire members and particularly with regard to credit repair, the, the two things that they're going to be looking at in the short term is getting repairs completed as capacity comes on stream. They get bills out the door and get those bills paid as quickly as possible. And that's where initiatives that have taken place during the period of COVID-19, I think are really welcome because I think there should be not just things that we, we do in the near term while COVID-19 is in place, but also look to improve processes on a go forward basis. Because I think the, the ramifications of this are going to continue for some time to come. It's not going to be a case of we'll breathe a sigh of relief and in uh, two or three months, everyone's going to go, this is in the past. I think there are going to be downside ramifications for some time to come. Uh, absolutely, and thanks for that, Peter. It's a good oversight of, of where the credit high industry is at the moment for obviously any um, repairers on there just to give a, a brief insight into it and um, we've had a few questions come in so Chris I'm going to come to you first and um, obviously it's a great overview of, of where the repair industry is and has been during this and um, what percentage of repairers do you think will be lost during this pandemic and those that are open do you think they will all have the ability to remain open and survive mm. I mean you know we, we, we looked at this when um, Brexit was first a threat and we know full well that repairers in the UK don't have a lot of cash reserves. Um, and, you know, when it started to unfold and we started to see the volumes drop, um, you know, my, my view of the industry was very pessimistic at that stage. You know, I really thought it was going to be absolutely catastrophic. Um, 40, 50 percent going. Thank God, you know, the government um, came forward with the various things that they did. Most importantly, the job retention scheme. But all the other things as well that has helped them, you know, get cash. And so far, you know, we haven't seen a, a great deal of um, fallout, albeit, you know, we've probably still got 15, 20% body that haven't reopened and, we, and we've not been in contact with them and we just don't know whether they're going to come back. Um, but, you know, as it stands at this point, um, albeit, you know, I think now, the end of May, going into June, is going to be the toughest time. Um, because they might have just sort of you know, kept, uh, kept the wolf away from the door. 
Um, but as they need to start paying their suppliers again and everything else and the, and the cash coming in starts to dry up, I could easily see sort of 10-15% um, you know, starting to, to crumble and go to the wall. So, you know, not, not ideal. Um, and there is going to be some you know, constraint, constriction in the market. But typically, a lot of the bigger players, if the work is still there, and we don't know whether the work will be there, um, we'll, we'll get swallowed up. You know, by by those uh, bigger groups, I would have thought. Yeah, Paul, I'll come to you. Obviously, you've you've stayed open for some part throughout um, the pandemic, but just and obviously, as I mentioned earlier, not asking sort of commercial sensitive information, but just touch on a little bit. Obviously, the sort of um, struggles you've had and how you saw it playing out, and sort of how it has played out in in effective. Before I move on to that, just picking up on what Chris said, um, I, I do. And, and the question you asked him, how many do you think are going to last? I, I think a lot of body shops may constrict. They may be smaller. They may come back, but they may, they may have to lo lose some staff. We don't know when the volumes, if the volumes are going to go back to where they are or where they were pre-COVID. Um, and the conversations I have, I speak to lots of body shops um, within the fixed network and, and outside the fixed network. And, and a lot of them are, uh, first and foremost, relieved that the job retention scheme came in, and that's possibly, that and the rates relieved, are possibly the only reason that they're not burning money, left, right and centre. And, well, you know, when the, when the numbers are this small in terms of profit margins, you can only burn money long before you go pop. And like Chris said, the only reason to see that is the government stepping in with the job retention scheme. Straightforward as that. I do see... Um, I think Chris's prediction on the 15% is probably about right. When the people I'm talking, nine out of 10 body shops. But like you said, and like I just mentioned, it's going to be a really tough time coming back because they would have burned the cash reserves. If they've got any money left from the grant, they would have burned the cash reserves and they will be struggling. I think parts, we've got some of the issues we've had with parts um, supply chain at the beginning hasn't completely gone away Chris it's still going we're still yeah. buying parts from suppliers that we never used to buy from and, and not having the discounts we have so we're paying retail rates and some we're still driving um, miles to collect parts for some other um, and we're in London you think how many suppliers there are in London well, God knows what body shops in the Hebrides are doing where they've only got supplier they must be traveling even further than us so those sort of problems are going to, I think they're going to restore for a little while. Um, the cost base of, of repairing a car, was, like Chris said, I think he mentioned that it's £400 per job, down to 30% volume. <laughs> On top of that, per job, our cost base is going up as well because we're travelling around to get a part, like I mentioned. Mm. There's lots of costs that have come into the, into the job um, that wasn't there before. And I don't see them going away. So the enduring issues we're going to have are the COVID-19 cleaning charges, the, the not being able to do double landers, the sending the truck out to pick cars up because you don't want to put two people in small confined spaces. I think the enduring issues that body shops face and whether they're going to come back, if they had 20, 20 staff to start, are they going to come back with 20 staff in three months time? When um, Rishi Sunak changes, we don't know if it's going to be... Um, a discussion on Friday. We don't know what he's going to do with the job retention scheme. We don't know whether he's going to change that, but that may have an impact. We might start to see those people whose jobs have been protected may no longer be protected. And you, that's where I think body shops will constrict and get smaller. Um, I think it's an interesting pull, uh, point, Paul, just to pick up on that. If body shops do come back smaller, I think if anything else, that's where the conversations between CHCs and repairers and body shops really need to step up in that sense because all the resources are going to be on you know get, getting the volume and, and getting it done and um, so in terms of the conversation stuff it, it's it's not as easy and um, chcs might feel that they're constantly chasing repairers and, and bothering them as such um in terms to get the information they need because the insurance company are asking for it or because they need the invoice so how from your side, can CHCs help with that? You know, if your resources are all going into the repairs because they're depleted, yeah. how can CHC help with that? Well, I think Sean, Sean touched on it earlier in regards to talking to his supply chain, if you like, the insurers, and getting them to pay. What 
just going sideways slightly, what we have seen is all of a sudden insurers can pay us within seven days. And, and some of them have stepped up and they've started to pay us within seven days and they've started to pay us really quickly. Um, makes me wonder why they couldn't do that in the first place. <laughs> and it does ask, then is that, gonna, is that gonna endure? That needs to endure. So if they can do that for us, direct contracts, why can't they do that for the CHO? And in turn, the CHO has then forward that to us quicker. I think there's a, there's a massive um, short term to term impact that we probably need introduced for all those body shops that are going to come start coming back. So, yeah, I think, I think that's where we can go. If the CHO and the body shops are, are, are both pushing insurers, on that, then that will help massively. Um, in terms of what we can do to make you know, to work with the CHOs, I suppose technology and caps and so on, the, the influx of calls we do get from CHOs is immense. Just for updates, is it going to be ready then? Is it going to, half the time there's technology out there now that can deal with that. There's, there's lots of, lots of, I won't go into the brands, but there's lots of software that can give them that information. Half the time they don't need to ring us. So that would help. Let us concentrate on the repairs. Let us concentrate on all this other added administration that we're doing and tasks that we're doing. Um, just to give us more time to do that. I think that may help. Yeah, Sean, I'll, I'll throw that over to you. Obviously, um, Paul's had made the point about you talking to insurers um, and whether you think that's something they'd be open to, whether it's interim payments or bringing forward payment terms for them. Obviously, it's a very difficult conversation to have. I understand that. But I just wonder whether there's any more of the conversations you've had that you can share um, that may suggest any of that. We, we're look, yeah, we are looking at that side of things in terms of what we can do with third-party insurers. I think one of the one of the key bits from what's going on at the moment, and I know Chris is really involved with this through through um, through another angle, is what are we going to take from what is going on now, okay, to learn from as a group? Because to be fair, one of the things that Chris said straight away is we are actually communicating a heck of a lot better as a group. One of the first things that I said is, we're, you know, the third, when we're reaching out to third-party insurers, they're open to these conversations, but we, can, we can't stop when the volumes start to creep back because the volumes are starting to creep back. It's almost like this is the platform now that we need to come together as repairers, the trade body, credit hire organisations and the insurers and we need a level playing field to actually to continue these conversations because we speak to insurers now we ask them can they pay us can they pay us for x y and z and they do it but we don't want to go back to their old model when all of this is over we want to build on it and continue to grow with the insurers and then just in terms of the conversation you have, just from a question we've had in, have you done any work on sort of debt reviews and age debts with insurers? Again, just anything you can share. I don't think that's one for myself, to be honest. Sorry, Matt. That's no, probably that's absolutely fine. For, uh, Mr. Watmo, which I can comment on afterwards. But yeah, from the supply chain point of view, I've not got involved with that. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Not a problem at all. Um, Chris, I'll come to you on a question on um, average repair length due to part supply chain. Um, what do you expect the average to be now? Uh, it's very difficult. It's, it's like, as, uh, as Paul said, um, whilst we were really struggling to get a hold of parts at all to begin with, there's a whole mixture of uh, issues out there with repairers having to drive, you know, 150 mile round trips just to collect parts and pay cash. Um, I think in, in terms of your probable concerns around recoverability, um, I think, you know, rather than looking at averages, you, you just need to work with us or the repairers need to work with you to be able to evidence the kind of delays that we are getting. So I don't know if there's a formal process for doing that currently. Uh, maybe that's something we can work on as an opportunity coming out of this, but inevitably there will be some, you know, considerably increased higher lengths as a result of COVID-19, um, you know, due to part supply and provision. And we are, as an industry are more than happy to help you with that and substantiate the kind of repair lengths that we, you know, you, you've had to endure. Yeah, Matt, 
just to interject there, I, I think it's more than just the actual lengths of repair. I think there's things that you can do there on the cost of repair. So as we were talking then about parts, um, I know for a lot of our network, they are still being charged um, parts as VOR. So regardless of where the parts are coming from, they're being classed as next day delivery, even if they're not. So sometimes those costs aren't passed down or communicated to the insurers, even though that's not finished yet. So the lengths will increase and we need open transparency on that, but also the costs as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, look, we, the CA, credit repair, right, we, the insurers, the repairers love it. You know, I've said this before, I've been to a couple of CHO conferences. You know, we do love work. It is great, okay? Um, and where we've got a difficult, where we've got a unique situation here is where we've tried to work with insurers, um, it's very difficult to gain any kind of consensus from insurers. They, they're all highly competitive. Um, you know, there is anti-competition, obviously. They've got other considerations like putting it into rates and stuff like that. I think with CH, CHCs, you could work together. You know, I really do think that on certain soft targets, CHCs could work together. Now, we tried to introduce suggested guide to temporary COVID charges into the insurance world. Um, and like I say, you know, some of it stuck, some of it didn't, but we were never going to get any consensus over it. You know, in CHC world, I think we have a unique opportunity here to rewrite the rule book a little bit and start making sure all of those costs that are being stuck, you know, that are being absorbed by repairers can be passed on in these non-fault situations and passed back to the insurer. They can't, you know, they, they, there is very little argument against it. So I think we have a tremendous opportunity um, you know, between the MBRA and CHO to work on how we can get improved credit repair terms uh, for our members at this point and repairers. I also think in terms of um, challenges that we've got, um, we need to think about parts discounts, you know, because a lot of the, uh, the CHC contracts uh, have pretty sizable bottom line discounts attached to them. and Never more so than now is that starting to sort of, um, you know, starting to sort of show its age because not only are we not getting the discounts, uh, as, as Paul and Sean have already said, but we've also got manufacturers starting to completely change their discount structures. You know, we've recently had fold uh, where body shops have considerably lost uh, margin uh, and we've got others coming down the line that are going to be like a, you know, a tsunami for repairers to try and deal with. So there's a lot of, there's a ton of opportunities uh, between the, the CHCs and the repairers that we can offer, that we can work on. Um, cash is going to be so important. You know, are there things that we can do to help fund repairs? Certainly in that first stage when cash is going to be so tight. You know, we love the work, but is there some way that um, repairers could get some of the money up front, maybe for some of the parts. You know, imagine a repairer that's been shut for, you know, for 10 weeks, um, is having to pay all of his suppliers, all the money from C8, from credit repair work that he did months ago has now come in, and now he's got an Audi with 10 grand's worth of parts he's got to buy, and he's not going to get the money for 60 days. You know, he's going to be, oh, where do I get, where do I do, you know, what can I do? So it's stuff like that, I think, if we think about it hard now, credit hire companies and credit repair could be an absolute white knight for the body industry. Um, I, you know, I think you could really help. I think we would really want to help you in return as well. To, uh, to Peter, I'll, I'll throw that over to you as, as almost a writing reply, I suppose. Obviously, you know, it's, it's different business decisions, but as a trade body, in terms of working together, working with the MBRA, um, is that something you think they can do? Um, yes, you know, at the end of the day, the, the cash is going to flow from the third party insurers through CHCs onto repairers. And it, it makes sense for the two parties, the, uh, the repairers and the CHCs, to work together to make that process as efficient and as streamlined as possible. Um, 
as has been mentioned earlier, uh, remarkably, uh, when it came to it, insurers are capable of paying within seven days, which does beg the question what they did in the rest of the time. But, you know, parking my cynical hat for the moment, um, I do think there's scope for us to sit down with insurers and use this opportunity to say, how do we make this process work better, take cost out for everyone? That's for the parents in terms of the time they spend on the process, CHCs and insurers, uh, and look to get better payment terms because at the end of the day, cash flow is king. And there's a realization that if you take the opportunity to take players out of the market uh, in a time of crisis like this, you are going to find that downstream that's going to come back and bite you. Uh, because either capacity won't be there when you need it, or price is going to go up because capacity is tight. Um, so it doesn't make sense for insurers to push too hard, but it is an opportunity for people to, to make the whole process efficiently, as efficient as possible. I mean, uh, you know, when I operated in the sector, that my approach to insurance companies was to basically try and create an attitude in their mind which basically said, here out the money, get lost. Uh, just you, ultimately, you want to make it easy for people to do what you want it to do. So, you know, uh, how do we work jointly with each other to make it easy for insurers to go here at the cash clear off? I think yeah. ultimately, this is the start of a, a conversation, um, and it is a conversation that can get larger, can include insurers, um, as someone suggested, to include engineers as well for the whole process and, you know, how we can make that a lot smoother for people. Um, cash obviously being really central to that um, and it's certainly something that there's obviously an appetite for, for everyone to work towards and as I said this is just the start of a conversation that hopefully um, we can build and sort of move forward on that one. Um, Paul I'll, I'll come to you I've got a question in terms of how you're operating with social distancing um, there's a member here who, who said you know they're effectively going to struggle um, to do that any ways in particular that you've sort of found to be creative, I guess, or, or to not find a way around it, but to work differently to make it work. Yeah, and I think the, the well, you, you think about it's all, it's all about risk. It's about reducing the risk of being um, being on top of it. And I think the specific issues we've had, uh, I suppose, because I can see the notes here on, on the side. I can see one, one one of the guys asked, "How do we deal with when he needs to support a bump on, for instance?" So we don't allow the technicians out of their bay, if you like. They're allowed out of their bay, but if they enter someone else's bay within that social distance, they have to wear masks and gloves. They, they need to mitigate the risk. They need to up their protection. We don't expect them to, sit with uh, to work with gloves and masks on all day, every day. If they're social distance away from another technician, that's fine. They're two metres apart, that's what the guidelines say. Um, if they do have to go into a, if someone asks for them, them their help, if you like, to lift something, fit a door, whatever, then we have to protect themselves. Now you have to sanction and you have to uh, audit and you have to make sure that happens. And initially it was tough. We had incidents where technicians at the end of the day were in standing next to their friends in the workshop and saying, it's five o'clock, you can't tell me what to do no more. Stupid things like that. Once you, once you get on top of that and you educate and you get them to buy in, and the peer pressure will work. You've got half of them that they don't want to catch this by all chances. They've got kids at home, they've got families at home, they've got lots of anxiety. They'll soon, they'll soon manage the other team members that aren't following protocol and following guidelines. And if they don't, we've got a senior management team in place that do. But to answer that specific question, in place, they're not allowed to break them. They've got used to them now, in the sense that we've been open throughout the pandemic, so we've had a good six, eight weeks to be able to introduce these. The toughest problems I'm going to have is when the, the furloughed staff that haven't been in have got to come in. We're going to have to induct them. We're going to have to teach them and, and get them to buy into the same processes that the current team are already doing. And hopefully, everyone will be safe. It's all about mitigating the risk. We can't cut out everything. We can't stop everything. We can't stop all interaction. We can't stop them going home and interacting with people outside of their households. We don't know whether they're doing that. We have processes. We check them with temperature gauges when they come in. We, we make sure they sign the risk assessment documents. We, we do everything that's in place, and the HSE can help you with that. There's lots of stuff out there that can give you advice on how to manage the workplace. You see the government working closely with all different industries. 
haven't quite worked as closely with us, but we can take from that and introduce it into our business. And it's been successful. Okay, I've got quite a large body shop, but every bay is taken, uh, at, well, will be when we get back to post-COVID. Um, currently, it's just about banging that same drum. It's, what do they say? It takes 21 days minimum to, to get new habits formed. Probably three months in my experience, but keep banging that drum and get those habits formed. If someone walks into an area where they're not social distanced, then they have to wear extra PPE. Simple as that. Another cost. <laughs> but it, it, there's more things that are more important than cost. Absolutely. And I think it's probably a good point to mention, you know, anything that is shared on here is obviously opinions and practices of individuals. You know, we obviously can't advise on sort of legalities, insurance type things, and it is just how each person's dealing with it. So it is obviously down to each business to to make sure that they comply with that um, in any way they can. Um, Chris, I'm going to come back to you in, in terms of COVID cleaning charges, which I think is quite a hot topic in the repair industry. Um, a suggestion here that £10 or an hour worth um, is not sufficient. Is that something on the agenda? Yeah, it's definitely nowhere near sufficient. I mean, um, you know, we were grateful to insurers that, you know, came out with these sort of COVID uh, charges to begin with, you know, but they were wholly um, insufficient, you know. Um, so we, we, we did some work around this. You know, there can be four times that a car could be disinfected. You know, you can have the courtesy car on the way out there. You can have the customer's car on the way in. You can have the customer's car on the way out, the courtesy car on the way back. You've got the higher costs of the PPE equipment, the higher costs of the cleaning equipment. All of this stuff has gone up. You know, we're sort of saying a minimum of 80 quid, but realistically, it could easily be a lot more than that. So, you know, I think there's some real genuine opportunities for... CHCs to be able to actually set these costs for what they are and we will talk to anybody about it you know collection and delivery costs parts collection costs anything like that they are genuine costs that body shops are absorbing we'll talk to anyone about it and we'll validate it no one's trying to make any money out of it um, but if you could accept you know as a as a group of CHEs that these are valid costs and that really body shops are there to make a profit as well, then hopefully you can pass these on to the insurers um, with, with our support and with our backing and with our validation of them um, and actually get repairers getting paid for something that they genuinely deserve. Uh, and it's a cost that they're having to absorb. So yeah, it is a hot <coughs> thing. Um, and I think let's keep talking about that, you know, because uh, th alongside that, there's other there's other charges that should be getting accepted on credit repair at the moment and just aren't even going anywhere near the invoices. Sure, and I'll come over to you on that one. Obviously, you you talk to a lot of uh, your repair network, so you know. What I, I I don't, uh, yeah, I have to totally back Chris up on that. I think the one thing that we need to take from this is you know. The fact of the matter is we don't know what's going to happen next year. We don't know what's going to happen in five years' time. We don't know whether this is going to be a tiny pinprick compared to what's going to happen in two, two or three years' time. I'm not being negative there. I'm just being honest in terms of the cost that Chris is talking about. You know, the cleaning charges are one thing. You've got repatriation of vehicles, back to clients, and how do you do that by having two people taking it back. You know, you, you can't do it if you've got one person taking the car back, what do they do? There's got to be a charge there for them to get back. There's a whole host of, of, of charges that, like Chris said, I don't think anybody's looking to make money from it. It's just having those costs covered so we have a sustainable business environment for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Most of the repairers that I've been, you know, working with over the last three months they are certainly not looking to make out of this situation they are looking to look after customers to look after clients while looking after their own staff and there is additional cost we need a platform and a charter whereby we can discuss and agree these costs for now and in the future yeah yeah you know so we, we are you know we, we'll say if we lay down the challenge here and now you know, we will sit down uh, with CHECs, CHO uh, representation, and you know we'll work through these things line by line. That's our promise to you, um, because I think you know, repairers and CHCs could, if they can't make something out of it, at least 
don't lose something out of it, which we're currently doing. And um, I think time is of the essence, you know, and we're, we're well up for doing it. Yeah, and I, I think as you both touched on, this is something that, you know, moving forward even past this time is, is things that are going to carry on for a long time. As you said, Paul, this is going to change a lot of, you know, the, the procedures and everything that's happened. Um, conscious of time, we've sort of got five minutes left, so we just sort of start rounding up. But I'm just going to cover a couple of points been put in as well. So if I start with yourself, Paul, um, I think probably the, the most thing from the comments that have come out of this in terms of CHCs towards repairers, towards body shops, um, is how can communication improve? Um, obviously, you've touched on the use of the technology for that there. Um, maybe that's not in every CHC scope. Is there anything else you can do to improve the communications? Um, there's mentions here about getting across the sort of proof of part delays and, and things like that. Obviously, these are all questions that are coming from insurers that are having to be proved as such. Yeah, I think, um, well, in terms of evidence from past delays and so on and so forth, there's usually an email trail when you're trying to buy parts, there's usually a trail, that, that, that's easy enough, but it's a frictional cost there. Um, why can't they just trust us? They know the problems are out there, they're seeing it, it's coming in, charges sent to them. We're not out here to, to do anything untoward. We'd like Chris did. And I think he said many times throughout the whole webinar, it's just about getting paid for what we do. Um, what we don't want to do is add loads more costs with technology and so on. Um, but if we do, then we need to be paid for it. It's as simple as that. It's, it's, we've, all, we've always made body shops as lean as possible. It's the only way we've ever been able to make money. And I, and I think someone mentioned it on a different webinar, but we can't make our businesses any more lean. We can't, we can't absorb any of this by making efficiency savings because we've done it for the last 15 years. We've done it for the last 20 years or so. We've got to a point where most body shops are as lean as possible and that's how they make money. It's the only way going forward. In terms of finding other ways, uh, I don't know. We, we like we said, let's all get into a room. Let's, let's look at the processes, look at the systems we've got. And, just have some open engagement. I say get into a room, we'll get on a Zoom, obviously, with social distancing. But it's about this open engagement. And like you said as well, this is the start of it. Let's let's go on from here and find ways of making these processes and these situations uh, more efficient. Absolutely. I, I, I guess, not to speak on behalf of this member, but if, if I'm right in what they're getting at, I think is um, understanding that these are questions that are coming from insurers. So as opposed to it taking maybe two phone calls to get the evidence across. It's just understanding that that is exactly what is needed because they need to send it on. I think that's probably the point that's being made, which you completely understand just to, yeah, to make okay. that clear. Well, if, if we're having those problems with certain suppliers, it's all about engagement. If we had a conversation with them and said, look, every BMW we buy is going to have this much cost on it. There's, there's processes that they can do. There's, there's um, for instance, the gateway in Advertex. All they've got to do is put a, uh, I don't know, just put a process in place that Aldertex will take that through the gateway, but it won't take it on a Fiesta. There's loads of ways they can do it. Yeah. We know they can do it. And it, then it doesn't have to be every single job to go through the rigmarole of sending an email, of scanning this, of copying that, and so on and so forth. It's about having a conversation. If we had a, every two weeks, we spoke to our work providers and customers and had those conversations, they introduced it into the gateway and off we go. Absolutely. Um, Peter, I'm going to come to yourself just in, in terms of a, a brief summary as well. Um, what we spoke about, sort of um, how the CHO would, would go forward with what's been discussed today. You're on mute, just to give the heads up. <laughs> there's always one person, it's fine. There's, there's, all, there's always one. Sorry, start again. Uh, I think this, this webinar represents the, the start of a, a dialogue and a process. I think one of the key things that needs to come from this now is, is, are some actions in terms of getting together probably some form of working party with suitable representatives of each organisation that sits down and starts mapping out suggestions and solutions to some of these problems that have been identified. Uh, you know, a lot of them people will say, can't you just? And the trouble with that sentence is inevitably as it contains the word just. Um, things that inevitably aren't as straightforward as they first appear, but 
by the same token, I think oftentimes there are solutions to be had. People just need to put their heads together sensibly to derive those solutions and sell the value of those solutions to the person with this big checkbook, which is the insurer. You know, you've got to make it easy for them to want to engage and activate the solution that you propose. Absolutely, um, Chris. And, and uh, I think I, I think we need we need to get on with that. Absolutely, Chris. I mean, similar to you, I'm, I'm sure your your views are very similar on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, um, no, this has been brilliant today. When have we had a group of repairers and a group of CHCs talking to it? It's been fantastic. But the three things for me, you know, we've got an opportunity right here and now to um, work on some agreed charges that repairers can start charging for credit repair work. I think we could do that and we could get those through to the insurers. You know, I think we need to talk about for short term how, how or if we could get repairers paid quicker than they normally would be and then passing that challenge back on to the insurers because that would be a shot in the arm for them as they're trying to restart their businesses with not a lot of cash and finally you know start a long-term plan to work together to embrace technology so that there's zero friction between the chc and the repairers and i think we're two sectors of the um of the industry that are able to work together and we can make that work and Sean, yourself, it's, it's five o'clock. I'm sure people are wanting to get down to the evening sun. But yeah, I'll just, come over to you. Just very quickly, I totally agree. I think the, ch the charge side of things is just basically sitting down and agreeing what's fair and reasonable. The terms of process, in terms of how do we present that to the insurers to make it easy, simple and palatable. We already provide a payment pack. It's just finding out what's needed in that payment pack to give them transparency to authorise and pay. So I, I, I'm going to eat my words. I don't think it's the hardest thing in the world. I just think we, we, we need a will and we need to sit down and, and, and put it all out almost in a new retail guide and a new process for actually submitting the costs. But happy to drive that forward with, uh, with the various members. Perfect. Thanks, Sean. And thanks, everyone, for joining. As I said, it's, it's the first of hopefully a longer conversation. Um, you certainly should all have my contact details through the invites. Um, and on the repair side, obviously, you should have Chris, as I imagine, as well. If there's anything you want us to pick up, post this. Um, and it may be that we, we come and do a different one as well. As I said, you've got our contact details. Please get in touch. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't answer every single question, but thank you very much for all your input. It's, it's been a really helpful discussion and hopefully it's something um, we can push on and do in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks, Matt.